Hello everyone, this is Gerald Salenti, and it's a special day because we have with us the judge, Judge Andrew Napolitano. And again, as I always say every day, all the time, and I mean it with all my heart and soul, that nobody says what the judge says with the authority and judicial background to talk about our freedoms, our civil rights, our Bill of Rights, and basically how they've been lost from us. And a thing called the Constitution has just about been torn up in a country near you. It's not only America. I love the word, uh, Judge, they call these democracies, yeah. How about democracies? Who are you kidding? You know, you just did an article over here about uh, the dangerous attacks on freedom. And it has to do with the, um, the, the new judge that they want to bring into the Supreme Court, Judge Brown uh, Jackson, and the Judiciary Committee hearings. And I'd like you to talk about them and what these judici judici Judiciary Committee hearings mean and what are your thoughts about this judge? And again, I want to make this clear. I don't know anything about this stuff. You know, it's way over my head. But the only thing that bothers me about it, and again, and I'm not questioning the qualifications, is that the purpose that they made clear when Biden picked the judge is that it would be the first black woman. And to me, you know, that's racist and sexist. I mean, she may be the best, but how about just picking the best person that has the best qualifications for the job? Black, white, green, yellow, I could care less. So take it away, Judge. Yeah, well, well thank you, Gerald. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I mean, uh, Joe Biden made that promise to African-American voters in the Democratic primary in South Carolina uh, in early 2020, and it turned around the Democratic race, or the race for the Democratic nomination for president. At that point, Bernie Sanders was actually uh, beating him. That resonated so well with uh, African-American uh, voters in the Democratic Party. It put Joe over the top, and he stuck to the promise. Now, is the promise offensive? Well, Ronald Reagan promised that his first nominee would be a woman, and it was, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, Donald Trump said one of his nominees would be a woman, and he was right. That we, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, he said, while she was still alive, uh, needs to be replaced by a woman, and, and he did. He appointed uh, Amy Coney Barrett, now Justice Barrett, to that uh, place. So it's it, it sounds a little odd <laughs> that the choice would be made on the basis of race and gender, but in fact, presidents have been doing that. Joe Biden believes, I don't, I don't subscribe to this, but Joe Biden believes that the Supreme Court should look like the United States does. I, I think that's hogwash. However, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, top of her class at Harvard undergrad, top of her class at Harvard Law School, a brilliant and gifted judge, is certainly qualified. Gerald, there are many libertarians who are pleased with this choice. Why? Because on civil liberties issues, she is far better than the Republican uh, nominees, except for Neil Gorsuch, who is a libertarian. So you're going to see Judge, soon to be Justice Jackson, agreeing with Justice Gorsuch on many civil liberties issues. She believes that there's areas of human behavior that should be immune from government regulation. The Republicans don't believe this. The Republican nominees on the court, with the exception uh, of Justice Gorsuch, believe the legislature can legislate in any area. Uh, I was uh, appalled at some of the questions the Republicans put to her. There's an area of human behavior. It's got a fancy phrase, substantive due process. It encompasses freedom of thought, freedom to choose a sexual partner, freedom to choose a sexual mate, freedom to have the kind of sex you want to have. Believe it or not, Connecticut used to regulate the type of sex that married couples could have until that was thrown out by the Supreme Court on the theory that there are areas of human behavior that are none of the government's business, just as Jackson believes that, and the Republicans attacked her for it. So... <laughs> 
The Republicans attack. You, know, you can't make this stuff up. I the know. other side of her, she's a big, she's a big government liberal Democrat. So, so you're, you're going to get half, half of the apple, rather than none of the apple, like the person she's replacing, Justice Breyer. You write the whole purpose of independent judiciary to be anti-democratic, to protect the rights of the minority from the tyranny of the majority which can be worse than the tyranny of a madman. Without an independent judiciary and without a doctrine that says to the government, hands off, <clears throat> we will be spilling the blood of patriots in every generation. Without the court stopping the legislature from legislating however it wants, we're talking about laws that made it a crime for married couples to use contraceptives. What business is that of the government? Well, um, well, well, what business, if you say that, Judge, then what business is of the government to tell you that you must get vaccinated? It has no authority over your own body. None. It can't tell you what to put on your face and it can't tell you what to put in your veins because you own your own body. That's this doctrine of substantive due process. Now, she's never ruled on vaccines and masks, but if she's consistent with what, I'm talking about Judge Jackson, soon to be Justice Jackson, if she's consistent with the way she's ruled in the past, she's with the libertarians on this stuff. I don't know if old Joe even knows that. But nobody asked her that, though, did they? In the, uh, in no. The, no. No. And then the questions they asked her, they wouldn't even let her answer. You know, she, she was a model of, uh, of patience. I mean, it, the politics makes such, such strange bedfellows. Here I am defending the nomination by a liberal Democrat president of a liberal Democrat uh, judge because the conservative Republicans who were questioning her were reprehensible, were ignorant in their understanding of the Constitution, and were attacking human freedom. But it's just crazy, the world that we live in. What the heck do the Republicans stand for? What do conservative Republicans stand for these days? Anything that's opposite of what the Democrats want, not independent thinking, not the concept of a balanced budget, of lower taxes, of, of peace rather than war, just whatever is the opposite of the Democrats. Yeah. Again, I, I think right, that I've term had, you're I've, using... I've, made my, uh, I've had my spiel. <laughs> no, no, no. No, the term that you use, though, conservative Republicans, I mean, why don't you just call them what they are, a bunch of arrogant little jerks? Yes. That's all they are. They're nobodies. They're nobodies that are on a power trip once they get into office. Whether it's you name him, and there, I mean, with few, 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 few exceptions, like Massey and, a, and, and, a, and, and Rand Paul, a couple of guys and women out there, right. the rest right. of them are all a bunch of political pieces of crap, conservative Republicans. Garbage, I garbage. That, I don't know what that means anymore. It doesn't mean what anything. The Republican Party stands for anymore. Yeah. When Barry Goldwater was the nominee of the Republican Party for president. You knew what he and they stood for. Now it's like, one year it's what Bush wants, one year it's what Trump wants. There's no, there's no ideology. I'll tell you who's very um, faithful to their ideology. And you and I blast these people to the skies every day. The hard left progressives, they know what they think, they say what they believe, they stick to their guns and they're consistent. Who, who would I mean, you if say? I were, if I were in the Congress, I, or in, the, in the Senate, let me fantasize for a minute that I'm a senator from New Jersey. How could I possibly vote to have Mitch McConnell as my leader? What the <laughs> heck does he stand for? <laughs> and how could I go to the other side with Chuck Schumer? I mean, it's crazy. Little, little Chucky Schumer and out of his mind McConnell. Look at that. Look at these guys. You know, you're talking about the rights. You know, this isn't making any of the news in America. Um, there's a, a case going on in Alberta, Canada, against the uh, chief medical officer of health. Oh, I love these names, 
chief medical officer of health. You know, take it easy, you're right. You're a stupid bureaucrat that sucks into the system because you can't get a job in the real world. That's who the government, bureaucrats are. Government loves fancy titles, uh, Gerald. I remember when I was first trying a case, I was laughing at the people that are testifying, first deputy, fourth assistant. I mean, it's <laughs> absurd, but they love that stuff. Yeah, and that's so they could keep power and make them feel like they're better than you are. Correct. So anyway, this is from CBC News. Dr. Dina Hinshaw, uh, Alberta's chief medical officer of health, is being cross-examined in Calgary court over the next few days. A group of plaintiffs is seeking the judge ruling that pandemic-related restrictions are unconstitutional. And they go on to say that um, the lawyer for the plaintiffs, which includes two churches and a gym owner, has argued that those at lower risk of serious illness from contracting the virus should not be punished by restrictions that target more vulnerable populations. And they go on, you know, and you know the Trends Journal each week. You know, we have the details in here from the beginning. I mean, from the very beginning, the CDC said 94% of the people that were dying from the virus had 2.6 pre-existing comorbidities. Of the one to 17 year olds over a period of two years under 600 died of the virus out of 74 million people so we're talking 350 people a year out of 74 million and 61 percent of them were obese so this law thing is going on over here. I think this could be very important, but no one seems to be doing it here. And what's your take on it? My take on it is that you own your own body. And while I agree with the arguments you just summarized, you shouldn't have to make them in court because no government in a free society where we consent to the government no government has the authority to tell us what to put on our faces and what to put in our veins, period. It's a free choice. You very rarely hear that argument made except from people like you and me and the good people watching us now. So while I applaud that argument that the lawyers are making in that court in Canada, something is terribly wrong with the system that the person they're suing has the authority to force them to put chemicals in their veins. Canada signed the Nuremberg Protocols, a treaty which prohibits all the signatories from compelling people in their countries to take experimental chemicals and drugs against their will. But treaties mean nothing. The United States signed the treaty as well, and we still were forced, well, many resisted and suffered for their resistance, to do it here. So the government never recognizes the limitations on its power. It does whatever it can get away with, whatever it will uh, it, keep it in power, because the people in government enjoy exercising power over us. The remedy is secession, to take chunks of geographic areas away from the government's regulatory and taxing powers. That will stop it in its tracks. You know, you got this clown over here playing mayor of uh, New York, this yeah. Adams guy, forcing you know kids like pre kindergarten and pre preschool children to wear masks even in private and catholic schools he's doing this he doesn't even have the authority to go in those schools without a warrant how can he have the authority to tell them what they do and what those kids should where do you know the psychological damage to a five-year-old oh. being forced to wear a mask when all the kids older and all the adults don't have to wear it? If I thought de Blasio was the worst mayor in modern times, guess what? Eric Adams is worse. He's more of an authoritarian. Oh, and he has that arrogant attitude, man. Oh, boy, is he arrogant. And again, again, the other th he just fired one of the people, a lawyer or somebody, for, for saying that she questioned him. You know, why are you doing this? And he fired her. You talking about Putin? You <laughs> yeah, Putin. Yeah. Yeah. Same attitude. 
disagree with me and I will punish you. Wait a minute. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution, Mr. Mayor. The Constitution includes the First Amendment, which protects the freedom of speech. You're going to fire a professional because the professional exercised her judgment in a manner different than you exercise yours? You sound like Putin. Wow, you said it. And but but this is going on all over. Right. And and you know, and again, talking about Putin, Biden, this is yesterday, or, or or two days, Monday, calls Putin calls to put Putin on trial for war crimes over Russia killing in Ukraine. So I I just want to go back here a bit. How about Putin calls Bush, Clinton, and Obama on trial for war crimes over America's killing in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, what they're doing to support the killings in Yemen. How about that? Am am I I I wrong? No, you're 100% correct. And add Harry Truman for dropping atomic bombs and slaughtering Japanese civilians. So if Joe Biden should be careful what he asks for, because he is in that same category, any president that sent drones to kill civilians or to kill non-combatants is a war criminal. In the case of George W. Bush, Gerald, the numbers are staggering. Yep. And the justification is infantile. He caused the deaths of between 650 and 850,000 Iraqis in order to bring about regime change because, quote, this is a quote, you can't make this up. Saddam tried to kill my daddy, closed quote. That's out of the mouth of the president of the United States. He caused uh, Colin Powell, who prior to that had a pretty good reputation, to lie to the UN and to the American public about whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction there. Even if there were weapons of mass destruction, who the heck is the United States and Great Britain and China and Israel and Russia that only we can have those weapons? Who the heck are we to invade another country because they have the weapons that we developed? I mean, this is insane. Well, we have insane people leading us. You mentioned George Bush. He, he, Saddam tried to kill my daddy. How about, how about we're going to get that guy Osama bin Laden dead or alive in Afghanistan? Invading Afghanistan, who had nothing to do with 9 11 because right. allegedly Osama bin Laden was there, a 20 year war, and you put the Iraq war, the Afghan war, all the war, the Syrian war, the Libyan war, all the murder going on. Oh, and they're talking about Russia? And the American media never covered, never covered day after day after day. You mentioned how many people were killed in Iraq, how they destroyed the place. Correct. Bombed it. it Let me bring it down to dollars and cents. It's $12 trillion. $12 trillion. Not a nickel of it tax dollars. All of it borrowed, none of it repaid, all on the backs of taxpayers as yet unborn to pay back those debts. Well, it enriched the military. I'm sorry, what? The last president that balanced the budget, it's going to blow your mind, William Jefferson Clinton. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You can't make this up. Yeah. That was that whole that whole boom going on at the beginning of the dot com era. Yep. Correct. Yep. Correct. You know, Russia must not win the war. German Chancellor Schultz tells the Bundestag. This is today. And they're going to be sending more weapons. During his opening speech, Schultz spoke of war crimes committed by Russian forces in Ukraine saying, quote, the perpetrators of those who commission them have to be held accountable. It has to remain our goal that Russia does not win this war. Who the hell are you to say what the goal is when you have nothing to do with this? And this has been going on between Russia and Ukraine for how many 
hundreds or thousands of years? At least, at least hundreds of years. Gerald, this is the danger that you and I talk about. When people turn on Fox and CNN, and I'm, I'm not blaming the networks because they're in the business of getting ratings, and they see uh, dead bodies with their hands tied behind uh, their back. This is ginning up the public to accept the concept that we might enter that war. This is, this is ginning up the public, the government, uh, the military industrial uh, complex and the media getting the public ready for war. You have said that first before anybody else. We repeat it every week because the evidence of this complicity between the military industrial complex, the government and the media keeps getting stronger every week. And again, am I, who is he to say it has to remain our goal that Russia does not win this war. Am I missing something here? No, but, but Putin is not going to be stopped by uh, sanctions. I mean, Doug McGregor, Colonel McGregor uh, is right. If we hadn't supplied them with weapons, the Russians would have marched in, taken oh, yeah. control without destroying the country. I know. And without killing civilians and without causing uh, the refugee uh, crisis. But again, who is one country to say who should win this war? This isn't our issue, and they're ignoring the facts of why the war began in the first place. Again, this is the wrote about it in full detail going back to 2014. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts writing about how the United States overthrew the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine and put in this guy Yats, the clown, and one jerk after another. Nobody talks about the corruption, the crime, how terrible Ukraine was doing before this, how NATO has expanded, you know, quote, not one inch further was the deal that was made. There were 16 NATO countries back then when Khrushchev made, made the deal, not Khrushchev, Gorbachev made the deal with Bush Sr. In, in 1990, and then Clinton started moving, and so went from 16 NATO countries to 30 NATO countries now. Yes. But nobody talks about this. So who the hell is this guy, Schultz? Germans who killed 27 million Russians in World War II to say that it has to remain our goal that Russia does not win this war. This is what we confront every week, uh, Gerald. Part of it is the concept of, uh, of collective security, that uh, you, know, you attack one member of NATO, you've attacked all of them. That legal fiction will provoke World, World War III in a heartbeat. <laughs> that legal fiction, that's a great line. Judge, the world needs you. The world needs a judge of freedom, a man of peace, and a defender of justice. And I, there's no time now more than ever that we need a new leadership, a new parties, and we have to break away from this and bring back the true American spirit. You're a man of the people, for the people. And the American spirit was with a guy that these guys probably never heard about, George Washington, his farewell address, warning yes. the American people never to get involved in foreign entanglements, never to take a side in another country, good or bad, like them or dislike them. It's not your business. This is your country. This is Correct. what you have to protect. This is what we uh, deal with. If, if more people understood what you just said, take out the flattering stuff about me, but if more people understood the, the truthfulness and the value of staying out of foreign entanglements, we'd be freer and richer and at peace. Thank you very much, Judge, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for all that you do. And again, there's nobody that says what Judge Andrew Napolitano says with the authority and the judicial background. Thank you so next, much. Uh, next Monday, uh, 1245 Eastern on Judging Freedom, Ron Paul. Oh, great. Great. And give him my <laughs> There's best. There's a great human being. Oh, I There's love a Ron. Great human being. 
There's no, yeah. there's no man alive that I look up to more than Dr. Ron Paul. What he gave, gives and, and continue to give is, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm right on his page, man. I really admire him so deeply. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Thank you, Gerald. All the best.